Accelerating the Momentum Created by Malala and Nirbhaya by Rashidul Bari, as published in The Sun of India, voiced over by Michael Arias. The resistance against discrimination and violence against women in the Indian subcontinent has finally gained momentum some 150 years after Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar tried to uplift the status of women by banning the practice of burning widows alive and proposing and pushing through the Widow Remarriage Act 15 of 1856. Discrimination against women by men is nothing new in the patriarchal Indian subcontinent. However, the huge public protests in the subcontinent, mainly led by men, in response to the recent assaults on two girls, Malala, a 14-year-old Pakistani, and Nirbhaya, a 23-year-old Indian, are unprecedented. Were he alive today, Vidyasagar would be surprised to see such an improvement in Indian society. So can the two biggest countries in South Asia defeat gender discrimination the way they defeated colonial rule and contain religious violence in the past? Let's consider the past for a moment. In the 19th century, the primary challenge of the Indian subcontinent was battling colonialism, and in the 20th century, it was religious violence between Hindus and Muslims. Today, it is discrimination and violence against women. The gloomy tone of this gender catastrophe was captured by a global poll conducted by Thomson Reuters. India and Pakistan are one of the most dangerous regions in the world for women, as women in these societies are continuously victims of violence, rape, and murder. In fact, De jour equality between men and women has never been translated into de facto equality in these two nations, where women are considered inferior to men. Consequently, many crimes against women have gone unnoticed since the time of Vidyasagar. This is why I thought the crimes against Malala and Nirbhaya would also go unnoticed. But I am glad that I was wrong. In fact, these two assaults have triggered a mass outpouring of grief and anger not only in Pakistan and India, but across the world. Moreover, the men of the Indian subcontinent, led by Shah Rukh Khan, who is equally popular in both nations, admitted to the sins committed by previous generations and offered his apology to victims' families. We are sorry that we are men. Why have Indian and Pakistani men finally not only decided to apologize but also protested the assaults against Malala and Nirbhaya, which took place almost back to back under similar circumstances and in the same year? What is so special about the cases of Malala and Nirbhaya? Let's study both cases carefully. On October 9, 2012, several Taliban gunmen stopped a bus that was carrying Malala to her home, boarded the bus, and pointed guns at everyone, asking for Malala. A heavily armed masked man searched for the girl, shouting, we want to kill her because she is propagating against the jihadists. So, let me know, which one of you is Malala? The gunman finally spotted Malala in the corner of the bus and immediately shot her in the head and said, You're a symbol of the infidels and obscenity, so you must die. Malala barely survived, but Nirbaya was not so fortunate. Like Malala, Nirbaya also boarded a bus with the intention of returning home. She became suspicious when the bus deviated from its normal route and its doors were shut. When Nirbaya objected, a group of six men already on board began beating her with a metal rod until she lost consciousness and then pounced on her and dragged her to the rear of the moving bus where they gang raped her. Once the men were finished raping and beating Nirbaya, they threw her unconscious body out of the moving bus. She died almost two weeks later while undergoing treatment for the severe damage to her internal organs caused by this horrendous sexual assault. However, Malala and Nirbaya are only two of the millions of victims of violence against women. Furthermore, every year more than 50 million women are similarly assaulted in South Asia. These numbers reveal a terrible but neglected inequality that leads to tremendous social problems. These phenomena can be better understood through Nobel laureate Amartya Sen's classic essay, More Than 100 Million Women Are Missing, in which he coined the term missing women to describe the large number of women in South Asia, especially in Pakistan and India, who literally lost their lives due to discrimination. Moreover, Cheryl Wooden's study revealed that about 40,000 baby girls die annually in South Asia because their parents do not give them the same medical care that they give boys. Other studies have drawn similar outlines. Bride burning takes place approximately once every two hours in India. Women are stoned to death approximately once a day in Pakistan. And physical torture for dowry occurs once every two minutes in Bangladesh. Furthermore, such marginal women are sometimes trapped in traffic to the Middle East, for example. Qatar is a major destination for women trapped in involuntary servitude and, to a lesser extent, commercial sexual exploitation. 
Women from India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh who travel to the Middle East as laborers and domestic servants often become victims of involuntary servitude. While it is encouraging that the assaults of Malala and Nirbhaya have finally caused the fight against discrimination against women to gather momentum, apologies such as Shah Rukh Khan's are not enough to eradicate this problem. So, the big question is, how can we end discrimination against women, a symptom of culture of poverty? Two root causes of discrimination against women have been identified, poverty and the culture of poverty, both of which are positively correlated. That is, there is a correlation between the poverty suffered by a family and the probability that the children of that family may later become terrorists, such as the one who shot Malala, or rapists such as the ones who raped nearby. Let's use Oscar Lewis's theory to test whether correlation proves causation. Lewis deduced the conclusion from a set of anthropological premises. Culture implies a design for living, which is passed down from generation to generation. We developed this culture of poverty theory from the concept that poor people share the same value system. The theory suggests that the poor remain in poverty because they lack the motivation to dream tall. Like a chronic disease, this attitude transfers to their children. This is why poor children, unlike the rich, are unable to dream big, think big, or talk big. The world of dreams for most children begins in the form of make-believe role-playing games involving a number of occupations with which they are at least superficially familiar. A child whose father is a scientist, for example, wants to become a scientist by the time he turns five. When such a child reaches high school, he has usually narrowed down the rage and decided whether he really wishes to be a scientist or a physician. However, a child whose father is very poor, for example, is unable to stay out of trouble, let alone contemplate being a scientist. In his book, Five Families, Mexican Case Studies in the Culture of Poverty, Lewis wrote about how children were socialized into behaviors and attitudes that perpetuated their inability to escape poverty. Usually, poor children have neither the knowledge nor the ideology to see the similarities between the problems and those of others like themselves everywhere in the world. In other words, they are not class conscious. I have examined Lewis's theory during my stay in Dhaka Tseljin slum in 2007. I asked a set of questions to 12 children whose median age was 13. What are you going to be when you grow up? They did not immediately respond. After a while, they began to mention suitable professions with which they were familiar. Rickshaw driving, bus driving, shopkeeping, blacksmithing, fishing, cooking, and begging. None said that they would like to become terrorists like the one who shot Malala or rapists like those who raped Nirbaya, although some of them eventually will end up becoming as terrorists or rapists or both. I then asked them whether they had heard about Dhaka University. The answer was Sanoni. No. In contrast, my eight-year-old son is not only able to take the derivative of any calculus problems, but he can also accurately write the names of the 2012 Nobel Prize laureates. I have observed exactly the same consequences that Lewis observed with Mexican poor families and realized that people with a culture of poverty are lacking motivation and ambition. Hence, these people need more than monetary support to escape from this culture of poverty. Hanging those who assaulted Malala and Nirbaya won't remove the root cause of this problem. Perhaps such violence will stop for a while, but it will resurface. Hence, there are five steps that will help break the cycle of poverty and automatically lead to end of culture and poverty. 1. Creating social businesses that develop funds to empower poor people. 2. Creating a scholarship program to help pupils combat generational poverty. 3. Creating sponsorship programs whereby wealthy people such as Shah Rukh Khan can sponsor at least 500 children living in poverty every year. 4. Awarding scholarships in the names of the sponsors. And 5. Using the recent momentum to fight gender discrimination to accelerate the feminist movement throughout South Asia, similar to how women in the West protested against discrimination a century ago. For example, when Marie Curie was excluded by the Swedish Nobel Committee for consideration as one of the scientists who discovered radium, protests were staged, including by Curie's husband. Marie Curie's name was added only after her husband's insistence and much later than the initial recommendation for the Nobel Prize was made. This single event contributed significantly to the emancipation of women, particularly in the West, as many women started protesting against unfair laws and customs. These protests became massive in 1913, when women's social and political union leader Emily Davison killed herself by running in front of the English king's racehorse. Then, in 1920, seven years after, Davison's death, the U.S. adopted the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, granting all women the right to vote. The countries of the Indian subcontinent can also no longer ignore such discrimination, more than 150 years after the introduction of the Widow Remarriage Act 15 of 1856. 
I think that the people of Pakistan and India decided to stand up for Malala and Nirbhaya because this is the only way to fill the gap between Vidyasagar's promise of Indian ideals and the contemporary reality. Like Vidyasagar, let's help all the women of Pakistan and India to use the momentum created by the assaults on Malala and Nirbhaya to accelerate women's emancipation, not only by hanging those who assaulted these girls, but also by taking the necessary actions to remove the culture of poverty, which is the root cause of this social phenomenon. This article was titled, Accelerating the Momentum Created by Malala and Nirbhaya, as published in The Son of India, written by Rashidul Bari and voiced over by Michael Arias. Rashidul Bari, a biographer of Muhammad Yunus, most recently authored the Grameen Social Business Model, a manifesto for proletariat revolution. He is currently collaborating with Dr. Daniel Kabat to complete a physics book.